visible eye. Likewise, Tamladov and the green hills of Devi, which I dearly love. My thoughts return to you from my darkish black cell. So, friends and brave comrades, I bid you farewell. And our privilege it is to have been asked to speak here at the 41st anniversary of Thomas Michael Lee. A very warm welcome to you all. I'd like to start by reading an extract strike from the pen of Dixie Elliott, a comrade and cellmate of Tom's on each four. I hope this goes a small way and helping us to understand the sheer courage, determination of these men who give their all for you and me. It was the winter of 1978, and Christmas was about a week away. Big Tom McElwee and I waited and listened as the screws got closer. On up the wings, locks rattled, cell doors flung open, and we heard bare feet scurrying on the floor as those in the cells before us tried to escape the heavier sounding bits of screws. There was no escape. This was the heat blocks. We were naked except for a blue towel wrapped around our waist and encased within a concrete hell on earth officially called H4. There was no escape from the hatred that lined the wing, locked away at the grills and either took physical form in beatings or looked on in white sure to come out. The wing shifts and forced washing had begun, what was clearly another attempt at breaking us. That winter was the worst in years, so bad we thought it would surely reach through the broken windows of our cells and that a icy touch would claim some unfortunate comrade in the night. Big Tom waited by the cell door, with fists clenched he had a low tolerance of bullies, and he fully intended on taking these bastards on. I stood near the window and silently cursed his courage, as fear chilled my very bones. Screws moved around outside her cell. It was too soon, me thought, as there were several cells before us to get. The hatch opened, a set of eyes peered through at us, keys rattled, and they were in on top of us, pushing, punching, and grabbing at her matted hair. We had taken by surprise, and before we could react, we were being run down the wing, through the various sets of grills and across the circle, towards a newly cleaned wing. There they waited, the cleaning crew, with their tools of torture. Ordinary, everyday things like a bath, a scrubbing brush, scissors, and a mirror. Depending on their sixth sense of humour, the bath would either be filled with scalding hot or freezing cold water. We would be plunged into it and scrubbed until our skins almost bled. Her hair and beard, beards would be shorn from her heads with the scissors. The mirror was the final act of degradation. We would be forced to stand spread eagled over it, then beaten down until we almost sat on it. There were two chairs, the plastic type you would find in a waiting room, and most definitely not those used by the barbers but that we knew was to be their purpose. Big Tom stood with defiance in his eyes and his mouth locked in grim determination. I knew what was going to happen next as they tried to force him into the chair. I wrestled, wrestled with those trying to force me down. A screw was poking me with a pair of scissors. Then Tom drew out and caught a screw with one of his big fists, sending them crashing backwards onto the police floor. Fuck this, I thought, before hitting the screw, you had the scissors. We took a terrible beating from boots and battens. I know that much, but strangely, I can remember little else about it. I do remember being flogged into the back of a van naked, like some piece of dead meat. The screws were waiting for us in the punishment blocks, where we got another beating. After they had finished with us and left, Tom was still defiant as he called me out the side of the cell door. I was just too cold and sore to be defiant, so I felt sorry for myself. They starved us as part of the punishment. The number one diet, as they called it, consisted of dry bread, 
and black tea for breakfast with watery soup and a single piece of potato for dinner. We got the same dry bread and black tea again at tea time. The Christmas amnesty set us through as they let us go back to the wing on Christmas Eve. The tears of the lads did nothing to lift my spirits as he followed Big Tom down the wing, banging cell doors as he went. Later that night, we had the first decent meal in a week. When you've been starved, anything's a decent meal. As we ate, somewhere in the distance, I heard for a brief moment Mary's boy child, Boney M's Christmas hit of that year. Some screw had decided to remind us that it was indeed Christmas <coughs> before turning it back off. We rose to our cell doors as one and sang at the bastards. The sing-song lasted into what was probably the early hours of Christmas morning. We had no way of knowing, as there was no church bells to ring on Christmas Day in the heat box. Tom and myself were sent to a wing in heat six, along with the blanket leadership in early 79, even though we didn't hold positions of leadership ourselves. This move was an attempt to break the protest by isolating the staff from the bulk of the blanket men particularly the, the young lads in Heats 3, who bore the brunt of the brutal beatings meted out by the screws. We were both then moved to Heats 3 later that year, when the wing in Heats 6 was broken up after the tactic had failed. Before Tom went on hunger strike that terrible summer in 81, he called me aside at Mass one Sunday. He slipped me his rosary beads. He still had that defiant look on his face, as he told me, hold on to them. I didn't believe that Tom wouldn't be back. He was a fighter, a hard man with a big heart. Big Tom McAwee didn't return. He died on the 8th of August 1981, after 62 days in hunger strike. I treasure those battered and worn rosary beads in memory of my friend and comrade, Thomas McAwee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to do the lowering of the flags. Actually, we'll now play McAwee's Farewell.
will now have a reflayers. We'll be a reflayed on behalf of the Thomas Ice Society and a wreath from friends and comrades. I come to this graveyard because he and my comrades are inseparable here. Death was always on, on the charge. At the end of the war, I thought we might have lost one. But we lost four. In the back of the days, we seen the heroes laughing and joking. And I stand at the grave broken hearted. But I have great memories and keeps me going. God bless you, Frank. God bless you, John. And God bless you, Dominic. And God bless John Davy Lion Lobby. On behalf of the 1916 societies, we would just like to say, could you please join us on Sunday for a rally for independence, sovereignty and the 32 county socialist republic on a march in Coal Island, County Tyrone, beginning at 12 noon, assembling at Honour Her Hull Monument in Coal Island. See you all there, everyone welcome. Stop talking and start walking. Gallon South Derry, you are forever blessed. In the struggle for freedom, you've given your best. There's Hughes and there's Bateson, there's Sheridan and Lee, and inscribed with their names now. Big Tom Michael Lee. Around the end.